Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody, whoever it might be. Buongiorno a tutti. Today we have a speaker from Italy, Paola Schieri, and he will tell us everything and more about quantum principle bundles on projective basis and their differential calculi. Paolo, it's all yours. Take it away. Thank you, Piotr. Hello. So I'm, I'm very pleased today to be with you and to give uh, this uh, talk uh, online uh, discussing uh, how to construct uh, principal bundles on uh, non-commutative uh, projective varieties and uh, together with the principal bundles also the um, differential calculi on such non-commutative principal bundles. Let me say that uh, this work is uh, a work done in collaboration <clears throat> with uh, Rita Fiorezi and Emanuele Lattini in the first uh, paper where no differential calculus was considered. And then uh, with uh, also Thomas Weber joined uh, us in a more recent paper that uh, we submitted last year. So um, let me uh, say that this uh, work, uh, the talk, today's talk will be divided uh, basically in two parts. <clears throat> there will be a first part uh, uh, studying uh, uh, differential calculi on hopf galois extensions. And then a second uh, uh, more uh, part, uh, more I, I will deal uh, with more, will devote more time on the second part, where, uh, first of all, I will introduce uh, the shift up and motivate the shift approach to quantum principal bundles, and then extend this shift approach to the differential calculi on, on bundles. And uh, finally, I will close with two examples where everything will be quite explicit. So given this plan, let me go to some very basic uh, notation that uh, we will uh, uh, use, I will use uh, all uh, the way along in this talk. So I decided uh, just to recall uh, the classical counterpart of a hof galois extension. I will uh, consider a bundle, a principal bundle. The structure group, I will denote it with P because later on will be some parabolic subgroup of some algebraic uh, semi-simple group. <clears throat> The total space let be E, and uh, uh, yes, we have an action of but I think correct. So E divided by by P, by not, e. by not by G. That's a very good point. You see, one zero for us. <laughs> very good. Comments uh, are very welcome, and uh, uh, and so this uh, we ask this to be an action and to be. A principal action, principality of this action, is encoded in the translation map from E Cartesian P into the fiber product of E tensor on M times E. This is a close sub space of E tensor E. The, I was saying the principal action condition is encoded in the uh, translation map, not only being a bijection, but also being ho a homeomorphism. Now, let's translate this, as usual, to the uh, algebraic setting. So the uh, algebra of regular functions on E, I take E and a fine variety, I will call it A. Similarly, the algebra of regular functions, polynomial functions on P will be 
called H, and similarly on the base manifold M. <clears throat> Corresponding to the action of the group P, we have a coaction that I will call delta or delta A. And uh, the- Sorry, uh, I have a question. Uh, please. So uh, you are considering functions uh, which are what? Uh, polynomial, real polynomial? Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, here I'm considering, uh, uh, this depends on the setting one is working on. Now I'm considering uh, uh, affine, algebraic affine varieties. Complex. And therefore I'm considering uh, polynomial functions. But polynomials uh, which are in complex variables or, or real variables? In complex variables. Complex variables. So, so C valued. Uh, of... Okay, so for instance, if if E is the linear group itself. Yes. And you are dividing by the parabolic subgroup. Yes. Then you obtain a projective variety. Wait a second. Here, I just said that uh, uh, I'm considering uh, um, algebraic variety, affine. So this is an affine. That is exactly the case I want. I cannot consider in this setting, and that I will uh, uh, discuss uh, later on. So, if you want, uh, let's think of this uh, as uh, whatever SU two. U1, S2. Everything is in the affine setting. And uh, uh, I was saying uh, the translation map translates uh, into the so-called canonical map. And the request is that the canonical map is bijective. That's the definition of a hopf galois extension, the extension being from the algebra B to the algebra A, that is, this is the extension. And uh, uh, the principality of uh, the action translates uh, in a more uh, delicate uh, uh, condition that of having a principal comodular algebra. There are many equivalent ways of defining such a condition. The one uh, that uh, I will mostly use for this talk will be that uh, A is faithfully flat as a right B module. Yeah, just one uh, correction, which I'm sure Tomek Rajinsky will be happy to concur with, is that principality is also, also means the bijectivity of the antipode of your function. Absolutely. That's exactly what I was okay. saying, but uh, I let you finish. Yeah. Here in this talk, I will consider half algebras with invertible antipod and half algebras on the field. Yeah. So, um, good. So, Let's uh, just give uh, some, uh, <clears throat> how to say, uh, motivation for these uh, two parts of, of the talk, as I was saying, this first part and this uh, second part. So for the first part, uh, considering non-commutative differential calculi on hoff galois extension, one question one can ask is the following. Take a, a um, <clears throat> of Galois extension. Take a differential calculus on the base space algebra, a differential calculus on the total space algebra, and a differential calculus on the structure group, on the structure of algebra. Okay, so these are the corresponding exterior algebras. Now, in some cases, this is itself a Hopf algebra. And it's then natural to ask whether there is a corresponding graded 
of Galois extension of uh, algebras, of graded algebras. Well, the easiest example where we can give a, an affirmative answer, and this is well known in the literature since time, is the case of a Galois object. Galois object is simply an extension of the base field, for example, complex number into the Hopf algebra. This is automatically a very specific Hopf Galois extension. The Bicovarian differential calculus, A Bicovarian differential calculus on a Hopf algebra H defines automatically a graded Hopf algebra of uh, exterior forms. And then this is a Hopf Galois extension, provided that this is a Hopf Galois extension. Now, here the situation is slightly more involved because we have a, a true of a Galois extension, not necessarily a Galois object. <clears throat> what we can say in this respect is a first, and uh, I would say expect a promising characterization of uh, such condition of obtaining a, a bigger of Galois extension, that is the following. Rather than considering uh, all uh, exterior algebra, Let's uh, uh, consider only uh, the uh, exterior algebra up to degree one. Or if you want, uh, let's uh, define higher forms to be zero. This can be obtained uh, simply quotienting this exterior algebra to up to one forms. Then we can still have, because these are graded, we still have a, an exact sequence provided that we, as I was saying, uh, just keep the degree zero and degree one. And the condition for having such an exact sequence, sorry, the condition for having such a, a Hopf Galois extension with a compatible differential calculus will be shown to be in one-to-one -one correspondence with the condition of having such an exact sequence. So this is an exact sequence. Let's briefly, uh, how to say, comment on it. We will comment uh, a little bit more later on. Mm -hmm. These are the uh, one forms uh, on uh, the total space algebra. <clears throat> This is uh, uh, canonically obtained uh, one forms on the subalgebra of coinvariance B. Well, uh, this is an A module, and so uh, I uh, do a change of base ring in order to obtain also here an A module. And what these are are uh, definitely horizontal forms uh, in uh, inside the total four forms on the total space algebra. And then further, we consider a, a, a map where now we, we map into forms, uh, you see, on the structure of algebra. Tensor, actually cotensor, the algebra A, so that this is a sequence of A modules. And uh, uh, this cotensor product, I will discuss it later, is equivalently, uh, can be equivalently described as left invariant one forms on the Hopf algebra times A. And, and so, in, since these are associated to vertical, uh, these, these are forms on the group, let's say that uh, <clears throat> left invariant vector fields on the group go automatically into vertical vector fields on the total uh, space algebra, vertical derivation on A, well, this map is called the vertical map. Paolo, using uh, the swiddler Heinemann notation, could you please explicitly write this vertical map? Uh, yes, yes. 
I I will do it in in, in four uh, pages. So okay. Um, okay. If you can wait, uh, I, I'll be more specific. So this was to motivate the first part of the talk. The the second. Paolo. Pablo, yes. can you hear me, Ludwig? Ciao, Pablo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but Omega One is by module, a by module, right? You don't use it here. Uh, second, Omega One of A. Yes, yes, yes. Isn't but it? you don't need you don't need the right module structure. Yeah, that's a good question. This is an exact sequence in which category? It's not about uh, tensory over A, it's cotensory. Yes, it's cotensory, yes. And yes. I have a problem with this. Be because it's not a sequence of uh, left A modules, let alone by modules. So the right hand side term is uh, a B module. Yeah, I mean, the, the, and H the, commodity. Yeah, this, yeah, exactly. So, right, like in Hop Galois, it should be left B modules, right H commodities. Now, but Ludwig raised a very good point. I mean, in which category is, is, is a left B module? So, on that, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Yes, since we are considering uh, covariant calculi, these, uh, these are right H commodules, yes. Um, Maybe I can comment, Paolo. So I think that you can actually make it into a left A um, module sequence if you take the left A action on the uh, on the uh, A co tensor H via uh -huh. the co-product, uh, so, uh, yes. sorry, so via the co-action. Co yes, yeah, yes, right. yes, yeah, right. exactly. Yes. Yes. Then this and, should uh, be left linear yeah, right. and yes. everything should be fine. Yeah. yeah, that's why I asked for a specific formula to, to make yeah. that determination. That's exactly what was written later on, yes. Yeah. The, the equivalence between these and these goes via just here there is a left action and here there is the co-diagonal action. Um, so, this uh, for the um, first part of the talk, for the second part of the talk, uh, I will, uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, show, uh, advocate uh, the fact that uh, when considering projecting varieties as a base space of a, a bundle, we cannot uh, use the Hopf-Galois setting to describe uh, it algebraically. Well, this is a well-known problem. Uh, the natural way to uh, go is to go locally and patch together uh, locally trivial bundles in the classical case, or set it uh, slightly more general terms, uh, to use uh, sheaves, sheaves of algebras and uh, of uh, commodial algebras. And that's uh, what I will discuss. And uh, based on such construction, I will uh, discuss uh, the construction of the differential calculi on such sheaves of um, describing non-commutative uh, principal bundles on projective varieties, and in general, also on fine varieties. The construction can be made explicit in specific cases where the total space algebra is a, a group itself. So we are in the case of a homogeneous space. And uh, this will be a general result provided some or extension condition in the non-commutative case uh, hold. And uh, we will see that uh, in these two specific examples, uh, everything can be written down very explicitly and there are no uh, obstructions. Okay, so this was uh, so far for, let's say, the, for the introduction. Let's uh, 
go to uh, this part that I've already discussed, uh, the notion of a uh, of Galois extension. May I have a question? Please go ahead. Uh, on, the, on, the page, page, on the previous page, uh, you had this uh, differential calculus of of uh, of degree in degree one or one forms in a sense. Okay. Yes. 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 It, it was here. Okay. Uh, how do you want to extend it to higher forms? In the classical situation, uh, this exterior algebra is a free uh, algebra generated by omega one over 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 coefficients. Yes. But yes. if you want to create the full differential calculus, you have to somehow declare what is happening to forms absolutely. of higher degree. Uh, absolutely. So this is this, this principal quantum calculus. Uh, principle is not enough. So, um, In the group one. So, de so definitely, de that's a... So, here, principal covariant calculus, I, I have a, a condition only on one forms, let's say, on degree one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that's why here I have a, a, an exterior algebra that uh, is up to degree one. If I want, uh, so ah, I see. You are, you are truncating this differential calculus, dividing yes. by by uh, forms of uh, higher degree. Okay, I'm cutting it. Forms of yes. higher degree are zero. Mm -hmm. Then you can definitely ask, but is by any chance this condition good enough to canonically give a condition yeah. here for all calculi? Mm -hmm. Well, this is an open question. We have some ideas uh, concerning this uh, open question, but uh, are not yet mature, let's say. Of course, so one has to make okay. some choices. For mm -hmm. example, one could take the maximal prolongation here. And, uh, and then here, the, the obvious choice, uh, since this is a Bicovian calculus, will be the, the exterior algebra considered by Voronovich. But these are things that uh, have not uh, fully been investigated, even okay, though so it's exactly one of, of the things that are open and interesting to investigate. I would say. So to be sure, so your uh, your algebra omega uh, bullet is uh, generated by omega one when multiplication of one force is zero. Is generated by omega one A multiplication of one force is zero. One. Is trivial. Yeah. Yes. Oh, multiplication oh, one form one form times zero. one form is zero. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Like. Mm -hmm. So uh, here we were. So let me uh, just uh, briefly say that uh, a principal comodular algebra is uh, uh, a hof galois extension that is uh, where A is faithfully flat, has a B module. So uh, what does this mean? Uh, let's recall that we have uh, a functor from left B modules in this case to left A modules and H commodules. And this preserves exact sequence. And also, if a sequence is not exact under this fact, we remain not exact. That's the faithfulness. So um, we also have uh, the inverse, uh, in, another factor, sorry, from this category of left A modules, right H commodules to the category left B modules, and is simply that of taking coaction invariant elements or co-invariant elements. Now, um, let me also recall this theorem uh, due to Schneider, uh, re requiring faithfully flatness or uh, 
principal, uh, principality of uh, such a comodular algebra is the same of asking that these two um, categories are equivalent. Can I make a quick comment, Paolo? Yes. Uh, you see, when you look in general at faithfully flat modules, you have some crazy examples of uh, uh, faithfully flat modules which are not uh, necessarily protective. And, and, but here, in, in this context, uh, everything is not only projective, but is equivalent to projective. And, and that's uh, a big power of this conditional principality because this gives you a link to K-theory. And, and, and uh, I think it's worthwhile bearing in mind. I mean, faithful flatness is, is a condition which comes from algebraic geometry because this is what gives you affinity of, of you, you, you can interpret your, your, your maps between rings in terms of maps between affine schemes. And this is where faithful flatness is fundamental. Uh, so from the very, very beginning, Kopkalic extensions were always considered in the context of uh, faithful flatness. But it, it was only when uh, people started to, to, to marry Kopkala theory of non-commutative geometry, where K theory is fundamental, uh, that it dawned on, on, on them that, in fact, you have much more than just faithful flatness, you have equivalent projectivity. And in this case, it's equivalent. That's another beautiful theorem of Schneider with Scheinbrook, uh, that, yeah. uh, in, in fact, uh, you know, implication one way is trivial, equivalent projectivity trivially implies faithful flatness. Yes. Yeah, sure. Even faithful flatness implies equivalent projectivity it requires a certain uh, argument, uh, but it is valid here and it works. However, maybe it's also worthwhile mention, to mention that when you go beyond Cop Galois theory and you go to C Galois theory, when you no longer assume that your coaction is an algebra homomorphism, then what you are left with is equivalent projectivity and you no longer can claim that faithful flatness will do. Thank you for this. Um... Plus the generalization, which I didn't know. Uh, yes, so the equivalent projectivity. Can I also make a comment? Hi, Paolo. Yes, Yes, uh, Thomas, you're very welcome. Uh, so uh, I think the, the second statement in Schneider's theorem actually says that uh, the functors that you wrote are uh, inverse equivalences. Yes. Not enough just saying that the categories are equivalent, but they are equivalent via particular functors. One is a coinvariance and the other is a tensoring. True that, yes. Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for this um, moment. There you go. So uh, we will indeed uh, use uh, these functors uh, uh, briefly on. Um, if I could uh, add something to Tomek, uh, Tomek's comment. Tomek, Tomek comments. May I? Uh, so, in fact, this, these two functors uh, are related one to each other by some junction. So, what is this about? It's about some very special kind of equivalence, which is called the adjo uh, adjoint equivalence. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So let's uh, um, recall uh, the basic definition of a first order differential calculus on an algebra A. We are um, <clears throat> requiring to have a, an A by module and a linear map that is a derivation. The other condition that we ask is a subjectivity, what I would call subjectivity condition, that is that the linear span of elements of the form ADB are uh, uh, the bimodule uh, itself. This uh, uh, definition was with A just an algebra, if A has extra structure, in this case, we consider 
a height h comodule algebra, <clears throat> well, uh, then uh, there is a natural condition for the calculus to be compatible with uh, the right h covariance. And here is the condition uh, that is, we ask the bimodule to be not only an a bimodule, but also a compatible with the h coaction. And D, we ask it to be collinear that is compatible with the coaction, with this coaction here of the bimodule, the H coaction of the bimodule. The compatibility of H with D is exactly this here. The coaction on the A is D tensor identity, the coaction, the H coaction on A itself. And this we can read indeed as a condition of differentiability of this action here, co-action here. Okay, given a, a differential calculus on a, a principal commodule algebra, such that it is a, a half galois extension of its uh, covariant elements, <clears throat> and uh, uh, given uh, as I said, a different calculus that is H covariant, uh, then uh, we can uh, automatically define, canonically define the space of base forms. This is uh, uh, simply obtained as uh, uh, the, the linear span of elements B, D, B prime, where uh, B are elements. Uh, of the subalgebra of covariance, <clears throat> and uh, there is a, automatically a, uh, I would call it a pullback uh, calculus, uh, a calculus on, on induced calculus on the subalgebra B. Another canonical notion is that of horizontal forms, uh, that is, uh, I change uh, the base algebra a change of the base ring from B to the total space algebra A. Well, then the first uh, proposition that we have in this setting is uh, that uh, uh, the base forms, basic forms, are simply the intersection of the horizontal forms with the covariant forms. The covariant forms are those forms that are covariant with respect to this curve. or otherwise stated, uh, here are the horizontal forms, and we do the covariant forms. Um, this is a result that uh, in the literature is, is, is definitely present, but uh, I decided to put it here and to discuss it with you because uh, uh, there's no necessity of any exact sequence in this uh, uh, context of uh, differential calculi. Some uh, other- so wait, What are assumptions for your proposition? The only assumption is that uh, you have a principal commodule algebra. Given, a, so uh, in, indeed the, 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 the key for such a proof is using this uh, equivalence. Yeah, but, but in particular, this means that you have an exact sequence for the universal calculus is equivalent. Absolutely, absolutely. Just for the universal calculus, that is the only canonical calculus one has. Yes, you can put it this way. But, there's, but here you see, this is not the universal calculus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anything, of course. Okay, so we have already seen two actors, the calculus on B, the calculus on A, and we are left with the calculus on H. And the, the calculus on H that is, uh, I would say, a natural calculus on H one could consider is a bicovariant calculus, meaning uh, that uh, the space of the module of one forms Besides being an H bimodule, is also an H 
by commodules in a compatible way. And uh, moreover, we are also asking the calculus to be compatible with this uh, so-called bicovariant by module by Voronovich or Hopf module. And uh, uh, the compatibility is again a request of differentiability of the coproduct, if you want. Once this compatibility is present, then the form of the coaction is uh, fixed. But uh, this is a non trivial request, this compatibility. <laughs> Uh, Sometimes we will also uh, consider only left covariant calculi, so we will only have this coaction. Okay, with these uh, preliminaries, uh, uh, I can then give a more specific uh, definition of uh, the exact sequence I was discussing before. Let's uh, take a, a principal commodule algebra. A right H covariant first order differential calculus on A and the B covariant differential calculus on H are called a principal covariant calculus if we have uh, this exact sequence. These are the horizontal forms that we have seen, are uh, these uh, uh, forms here. <clears throat> And uh, uh, the vertical map is defined in the following way. First of all, let me define the cotensor product. This uh, is uh, the span is defined via an equalizer, if you want, is, is the span of all elements such that the coaction, the right coaction on A equals the left coaction on the forms on the group. I would like to ask a question, but uh, not to you, Paolo, to Tomek, Tomek Brzezinski. Tomek, can you answer my question? I don't know. I have First, I have to hear the question. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is absolutely right, yes. Uh, but then when you hear the question, just answer it. Don't tell me whether you can answer it. Just answer if you can. Um, so this definition uh, looks to me a little bit like déjà vu. I mean, isn't it this exactness of the sequence which you used in your paper with Shan Majid uh, as a definition of a quantum principle bundle? I honestly, I can't remember exactly. I think we were doing what did we have? You know, there, we had a different. If you remember, we had a different definition of horizontal forms. Yes, because yeah. what, what, what Paolo calls horizontal, you call strongly horizontal. Strongly horizontal. Yes. Uh, and honestly, I don't remember. Okay. It was 30 years ago, sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, but one thing I wanted to uh, say that I... I I'm not. I'm. I'm not quite uh, sure that your, uh, Pablo, your definition of a cotensor product is uh, completely precise. Because when you write those the span, I mean, it's not the elements, the span of elements which satisfy this equi equalizer property, but it's the uh, combination, linear combination of elements for which this property holds. Yeah. I mean, typically simple tensors are not there. Yeah. So, so, so rating, well, I, I, I know what you mean, yes. but this is, I don't think this is uh, written. No, no, I understand because this seems I take just one element. Yeah. It, so exactly. That you take some, you know, bases no, no, sure, or generators sure. of your vector space, uh, but they are not. Uh, I mean, the, the, this vector space, the subspace is generated by actually uh, uh, linear combinations of simple tensors. Yeah, exactly, yes. So this is the spirit of Swindler conversion. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so there, there, there is a, a, but if you write a, a sum here, you don't need to write span. Sure, of course. So, yeah. Okay, so sorry about this interruption and sorry about not being, that's, uh, thank to you. look back that's, at my uh, 30 years back. 
Thank you. And Thomas. this heat is clear from from this uh, <clears throat> from this uh, uh, from using the Swedish notation. So here is the definition of the <clears throat> vertical map uh, being uh, uniquely given by this expression. So uh, here we have uh, the differential on the Hopf algebra. Here we have the differential on the total space algebra. And, uh, but one has to check that this uh, definition is, uh, is well defined. So in this exact sequence, there is also the condition of this vertical map being well defined. And uh, as was uh, just discussed, uh, this is the definition we use of principal covariant calculi, but uh, in the literature, of course, here, uh, there are really the experts on uh, principal commodular algebras and differential calculi. Um, these uh, uh, notions have been discussed in slightly different uh, variations. Uh, what uh, our, uh, as was already commented, the specific uh, um, point of view is that here we just take uh, forms, uh, horizontal forms in this way. And then the faithful flatness condition allows us to say that this is the same is the same as isomorphic to this. And, but we don't take the tensor product on the right. Um, in oh, other... so, so could, you, could you explain this caveat? There it might not be well defined. It's your assumption, so... Uh... Yes, yes. So. Oh. What you, what the assumption is there is a well-defined map. Hmm? So the, 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 the definition is there is a well-defined map, yes. and this map satisfies this condition. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, so what are situations yeah. where this definition is not so okay. So let uh, let's say uh, I which class. So, so the, the point is that. Uh, that uh, if you read it, uh, um, I mean, the, the mathematics, let's say, is clear. But one could be tempted to say, okay, any form is of this kind, sum over I understood, then let's define the vertical map this way. Are you writing nothing, nothing appears on the screen? Sorry? Are you writing something or? Yes, I'm writing something on the screen. But um, nothing appears on the screen. We don't no, know. No, I, I wrote the eyes. The eyes. Oh, ah, okay. So, and these, uh, these elements is a generic element of, uh, of gamma, of the bimodule of one forms. So, the point is that uh, I still have to check that this is a well-defined map, meaning that if AI D A prime I sum understood is zero, then this under this defined map goes to zero. Also, this other set, this other the, also the image is zero. Does this answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, it's a logical answer, but I wanted an example. Yes. For instance, what is happening for the universal diversal calculus? Then it's okay. It's okay yeah. under this definition of, of yeah. the horizontal. Yeah, I believe so. Yes. 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 For the universal calculus, uh, that's okay. Okay. Okay, an equivalent of unitality, way... of, the unitality of the class. Right? Mm -hmm. All you need is unitality of the class to, to see that it works for the universal forms. Okay. Because only D on one is zero, right? Yes, yes, yes. And that's the unitality, yes. Mm -hmm. 
So a, a slightly equivalent way of uh, presenting this sequence is uh, to recall that there is a, a an equivalence between the cotensor product and uh, the tensor of the base field of A with uh, left invariant one forms on the group. And uh, here is the explicit uh, uh, expression of, of the map. And as we were discussing a few pages before, uh, uh, this uh, is an A by module map provided that here the multiplication by A, the left action is simply multiplication by A in the first factor, and here is the codiagonal action. And in this sense, uh, here under this isomorphism, this is the no, the vertical map uh, reads like that. So you see. Uh, Sorry, so does it mean that this uh, vertical map for another definition of these uh, vertical forms is always well defined? Is, is it so? Because you have this formula and probably it is easy to check that, uh, that this condition is fulfilled. No, no, wait, uh, here I don't understand. On the right hand side, you have some description. Okay. Mm -hmm. If we assume that that uh, this map goes to to a tensor in gamma h, is it easier to check that this is well defined or not? I would say is the same because uh, you still yes, have, uh, let's say, to put here. Let's put here ai. Again, a sum. Yeah. Now, I just said it. It goes via uh, the left action, so it is just like that. And uh -huh. I will check that this is uh, is well defined. Okay, so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it is equivalent to this. Equivalent does have yes. Okay, but uh, so to say, uh, I like uh, to discuss uh, the vertical map in, in this setting also because um, maybe you can uh, tell me your view, but uh, the point is that uh, if I go dual, uh, the dual space is the space uh, of the left invariant vector fields on the group manifold, that is uh, the Lie algebra G of the group classically. And these uh, uh, left invariant vector fields, let's call them X, uh, automatically give uh, a left invariant vector field uh, on uh, A, Lx being a derivation from A to A, the canonical uh, one obtained uh, from the action. So here we therefore have a map from G to uh, the vector fields on A. Actually, the left invariant vector fields on A. And uh, uh, when tensoring with A, we have a map. is a left A module map from this space to this. And this, uh, classically, this injection corresponds to this quotient. So you are mimicking the construction of fundamental vector fields. Yes, yes. Or the principal action. In the dual, in the dual uh, setting. So let me give a, a, an example. <clears throat> Let's uh, here everything is the affine setting. 
we are uh, considering a principal uh, comodular algebra that is the, uh, that of uh, Podel's uh, sphere on uh, uh, the total space algebra is SUQ2. And the structure of Hopf algebra is just U1. So this is the of uh, quantum Hopf uh, fibration the, and uh, the, the monopole bundle, if you want. If we take the three dimensional left covariant, uh, first order differential calculus on A, so this is a, a, a quantum group. We take just the left covariant differential calculus of Voronovich on such quantum group. Well, uh, this uh, seen in terms uh, of this uh, structure group that is H is both uh, left covariant and right covariant. And therefore, uh, we can ask whether this sequence is exact. And that's indeed the case. This was is known. In the other, on the other hand, if we take uh, the four-dimensional bicovariant first order differential calculus on A, on uh, SUQ2, well, then uh, it's easy to see that this is uh, uh, not um, a principal covariant calculus. We can do it uh, uh, heuristically. Uh, this is a parallelizable and the module is free of dimension four, is four copies of A, the space of one forms. Here, the calculus is one dimensional. Here, as soon as we go in a local trivialization, let's say the North Pole or the South Pole, the calculus is two dimensional. And so the Sorry, dimension- there's no South Pole on the public sphere. It's just minimal limitization of compact operators. There is no South Pole, have only one character. Um, yes. It's asymmetric. If you want something like actualization, you have to go to generic, or if you're on the equatorial poly spheres, and uh, that's a completely different story. Yes. Um... Yes, yeah, so as I said, this was a very heuristical uh, argument. Um, this is a, um, yeah. Um, yes, uh, okay. Mm. I cannot use that argument. Okay, another example that uh, um, is, uh, if you want a, a consistency check that one uh, should do, is to take uh, uh, B, uh, a left H module algebra, so I have an action of the Hopf algebra H on B, compatible with the algebra structure on, a, on B, to take a, a covariant first order differential calculus on B, what does it mean? That there is also an action of H on the bimodule of one forms on B, and that this H action is compatible with the differential, meaning that it is differentiable if you want. And then take now the calculus on H to be a B covariant differential calculus. Then, as uh, Flaum and Schauenburg uh, many years ago uh, showed, uh, there is a canonical differential calculus. No, 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 no a canonical differential calculus. <laughs> there is a canonical differential calculus on the smash product algebra. And, uh, of course, the smash product algebra is simply an example of uh, Galois extension, a specific example is a cleft of Galois extension. And indeed, uh, uh, this is a principal covariant calculus. 
So it's another example that, let's say, if we go cleft, things works. I mean, it's more than cleft, it's smash. Sorry. Uh, yes. Cleft is more than. Uh, I, I said it, this is mesh. So mm -hmm. this is, uh, is a cleft of the Euler extension, but it is but even, it's it's a trivial <laughs> of the Euler extension. And I bear in mind, cleftness is much more than. It's yes, yes. cleft. Exactly. Yeah. It's multiplicatively cleft. Yeah, I like this. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. The cleaving map is an algebra map. Wow. Okay. So um now that uh, we have uh, uh, gone through this, uh, we can uh, give uh, the uh, main result in this context. Uh that is relating this uh, uh, of Galois extension to the faithfully, sorry, to this uh, exact sequence. So let's read together <clears throat> the, the theorem. For any principal covariant calculus on A, with a bicovariant first order differential calculus on the of uh, algebra H, we have a faithfully flat Hopf Galois extension. You see that I stop at degree one, such that uh, the uh, coaction is differentiable. Differentiable meaning is compatible with the canonical differentials that can be associated to these algebras. Well, these conditions are equivalent to say that uh, mm, the Hopf Galois extension is faithfully flat and the uh, mm -hmm. on the other hand, if the one and okay, sorry, let me read it again. If we have the exact sequence, if we have a principal covariant calculus, if we have the exact sequence, then we have such a, a faithfully flat hopf galois extension with such commutative diagram, <laughs> vice versa. If we have this um, hopf galois extension of graded algebra and uh, the coaction commutes with the differential, then um, we have a principal covariant calculus, meaning we have this exact sequence. The proof of this theorem relies uh, quite heavily on uh, results uh, that uh, Schauenburg uh, found uh, for uh, graded uh, algebra extensions without the use of uh, uh, the uh, differential, uh, the exterior derivative. A similar approach is also found in Durdevich. So this was for the part of the differential category on uh, Hopf algebras, on Hopf Galois extension. Now I would like to go to uh, the shift approach. So I will motivate the shift approach and see the, the differential calculus. Are there any questions uh, right now? It's a good time for Paolo and Ludwig, I have a question. So in all this, or only in some parts, you actually use not just first order differential calculus, but a differential calculus with uh, zero part of higher than grade one. Is it true? Or, I mean, do you need yeah. the quotient of, of uh, differential so calculus? We, can you repeat in, the question? So we say now all the time first order the differential calculus, but in some moment you said that you where you had the full differential calculus quotient that taking making zero all forms higher than grade one. 
is it an assumption you have all the time or it, you, you use it at once only and now you don't need in, in this you just really need first order different calculus and tacitly yes. assuming yes okay yes. Uh, let me see whether i can answer your question um in the uh, paper, we just use the first order differential calculus. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we, we don't need the higher order calculi. Now, the way we would like to think is, but this is just a, a perspective, it's not, uh, there's not, not, not much mathematical content, is let's. Uh, Because the original question is, can we do this for the full, uh, for, 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 <clears throat> in general, I would, I would, uh, consider, I can consider a higher order differential calculus. And if mm -hmm. one can consider a higher order differential calculus, then one can ask, but is this a graded of Galois extension? And if we are in this setting, the answer is as long as you quotient it to just considering forms of degree zero and one, then the of Galois extension condition is uh, um, equivalent to this exact sequence. Okay. So let me just, uh, since I'm quite interested recently with Andrew Hitler and other people here in this uh, in torsion, you, strictly speaking, you, if you have full differential calculus, you could also define torsion and would say that it is not zero uh, in principle, since it would be just D, exterior derivative D. But for first order differential calculus, you simply cannot define torsion as far as I understand. Is it right? Right. Yes, yes. Okay. okay. Yes, Thanks. so I cannot uh, see that aspect. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So the reason is that uh, there is a dif differential, the exterior derivative from functions to forms, but forms are not subject to differentiation. So you cannot speak neither of uh, Thornton or curvature or something like this. Th there's no connection question. Yes, yes. If two forms are automatically zero in this context. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay. So let me now advocate uh, why one should go more general than considering. Uh, um, of Galois extension. And let's start with uh, a, an example that is uh, classical, just to see that already there one has problems. So let's take uh, now. But I'm very confused. Why do you claim that SL2 is commutative? I always thought it was a non-abelian. No, no, it's about the problem, even in the, in the classical situation. No, I'm joking. It's, uh, I think this is, not a good idea to write everything commutative next to SL2. <laughs> okay. Ah, because it's a good okay. <laughs> All algebra is commutative. Yeah, right. Mean. But nobody, nobody speaks about commutative groups. I know. They call them a billion. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but so. Let's uh, let's uh, let's take uh, now SL two SL two C with action of the uh, upper triangular matrices uh, uh, parabolic uh, subgroup of SL two C. Well, then this uh, is uh, the complex uh, projective line. Now, this uh, is a, a definitely a principal bundle. But uh, if we want to describe it uh, in terms of Galois extension, we encounter some difficulties. So first of all, uh, let's uh, consider the algebra function on SL2. And well, then uh, this is generated 
by the entries of the fundamental representation of FCU2, if you want, modulo the determinant relation and the fact that this is a commutative algebra. Similarly, we take uh, the algebra of functions on uh, P. This is the upper triangular matrices with determinant one. So it's generated by T, P, and the inverse of T. And uh, uh, now let's go and consider the uh, regular functions on CP1. But this uh, CP1 is compact. So this, uh, if you want, in the complex analytic case, that this is Liouville theorem, this is just the constants. So uh, we end up uh, with uh, the extension of C into OSL2. Let's write it more explicitly like that. Hmm. And this is not hopeful. So the uh, description of such a principal sorry, sorry, but it is Hop Galois, but not with the group P. Absolutely, but that's uh, <laughs> so. Let's write it down. It's uh, it's correct. It's not Hop yeah. Galois. Yes, yes. That's what I meant. <laughs> So how do we describe uh, such uh, a situation in algebraic terms? Well, uh, the, the, the obvious way is to go local, to go via patches and to recall that uh, uh, we can consider uh, that uh, such a, a bundle is uh, locally trivial. On each uh, open, we have a fine, uh, they are automatically, these are fine varieties. So the Hopf-Galois condition or the Hopf-Galois construction can be done locally. In other terms, this idea of going locally is, is nothing else than uh, considering sheaves of uh, algebras rather than the algebra of uh, the uh, total sections on CP1. And so this is the, the idea to uh, have a shift a theoretic description of what is a, a principal band. In particular, it will apply to this case where all algebras are commutative, and it will apply also to cases in which this algebra, this algebra, and for CPN, this algebra will be non-commutative. So here is the, the definition of quantum principal bundle. I consider in this setting, the definition is given considering a deformation quantization of some uh, underlying classical uh, bundle. So uh, I take M to be a topological space, but I'm not uh, the, defining which is the topology in as a matter of fact, I will need a very rough topology, just the one needed in order to describe the bundle, not uh, the, the usual topology on, on, on CP1. And let H be help algebra. So by a shift, write H commodule algebras. Well, uh, we, as usual, uh, it's a a factor that uh, to each open it associates a right H commodule algebra, of course, to the uh, void set, uh, it will uh, associate the algebra with one element where the unit coincides with the zero, and then uh, we have the, the 
restriction more. We have morphism, sorry, from uh, given the injection of U into V, we have uh, such a contravariant uh, functor condition and the compatibility uh, of composition of such morphism. This is the pre-shift condition. Then we have the shift conditions here. If uh, A on an open U is such that uh, A restricted to UI, where UI are an open cover of the open U are all zero, then A is zero. And then the gluing condition. If I have AI on all I and on the double intersections, they coincide, then there exists a section of um, on all you. So this is the first condition. A second condition <clears throat> is uh, to have uh, a, a quantum ring space that is to each uh, my topological space, I associate a uh, sheaf of non commutative algebras. This, I think, is a deformation of the structure sheaf of the topological space. And then with this data, uh, I define a quantum. Oh, Can I have a question? Perfect question. So you started from the classical example of, of the of vibration over a sphere. If you quantize this sphere to a podless sphere, do you have some analog of, of, of this structure? Or do you deviate from the theory of uh, podless spheres, for instance? Well, the podless sphere, uh, uh, you see, I'm thinking of the podless sphere as a concept of um, a homo <clears throat> homogeneous space via affine varieties, via the U1 action. Yeah. So, I'm not in this setting. It's like, uh, the, the way I understand it is this uh, way. It's like, is if, is it, is as if, uh, instead of taking CP1 here, you would take S2, S2 being uh, the affine variety given yeah. by the radius condition. Yeah, but, but classically, CP1 could be obtained not only as a quotient of a sphere, which is not canonical, but it's a canonical, it's a quotient of SL2 by a parabolic subgroup. So this is exactly uh, in, the, in, in, in your context. So classically, it is so. If you, so this choice of this sphere comes from, from uh, cutting uh, a cone over, over CP1 to get, to get a quadric, uh, real quadric, and then uh, you reduce from this, par from this parabolic subgroup, these upper triangular matrices, to U1, which is a diagonal, uh, unitary diagonal uh, inside of this P. Yes. But it is par a parallel construction. So my question is, do you have something like 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 this classical construction uh, leading to the description of CP1 as a quotient of of SL2 mod uh, parabolic subgroup in uh, in the case of the Podley sphere, for instance? Mm, no, I have to think about that. Mm -hmm. no. Can I can I answer? Yes, please. <laughs> okay, so let me show myself. Hey. Hello, Victor. Hello. Okay. So the sphere is a real object. We're looking at the CP1, which is a complex one. Evidently, I mean, they're not isomorphic as complex varieties. They'll be isomorphic, they'll be diffeomorphic as real. But we sort of not look at the real structure. We care only about the complex one. And as you know very well, uh, the sphere is very different from CP1 because CP1 is projective, not embeddable into anything, while the sphere is a beautiful, affine object inside R3. So they're very, very different realms, right? And mm -hmm. the only thing is that if you look at them as real, of course, they're isomorphic. But CP1, we just look at it as complex, as quotient of 
complex uh, algebraic groups, right? So we never see its real life. This is why. Am I answering to your question? Uh, I understand your, your, your answer, but the point is that uh, this real affine variety, in fact, has uh, complex points forming, uh, forming a complex variety. Okay, so you're so talking about S2 having... Is, as the intersection between holomorphic and, and real. It's not, it's not a point. Because, okay. because so, if you have this quadrant, you can complexify it and then... And, and, uh, yes, okay, because there are two things you can do with a sphere. You can complexify it and get a beautiful analytic uh, object and not, we are not doing it. Or you can look at its complex structure, okay? In mm -hmm. one case, you double the dimension. In the other case, yeah. you take the real sphere and you don't double it. That's what we're doing. And we forget it was ever a real thing, right? Okay. So we're not doing what you suggest. We're not complexifying it. No, I'm not suggesting this. <laughs> I, I want to... No, no, I'm telling you, we're not doing that. Separate, separate these two, 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 two approaches. Okay. Okay. Hey. Thank you. Sorry, Paolo. Sorry. No, no, thank you. Oh. Thank you. That's a... Uh, oh. You are authors, so this is natural. So... So we were at the definition of what a principal bundle. Just to make sure we are on the same page. When you say a sheaf, you mean a sheaf over the same topological space M over which you take your ring space, right? Yes. So there are two sheaves, this and this, both yeah. on them. We call it a sheaf of right H commodule algebras, a quantum principal bundle over this uh, quantum ring space, if there is a, an open cover of M such that uh, uh, with respect to this open cover, the coinvariance of this uh, H-comodule algebra are exactly the algebra of uh, associated uh, to the open UI. And uh, this uh, uh, commodule algebra is not just a commodule algebra, but is a principal commodule algebra. So a faithfully flat of Galois extension, or equivalently projective of Galois extension. So you see, we have the notion of, of Galois extension, but it's just on a very specific uh, cover specific, there must exist a cover of M such that for those specific opens, we have a of Galois extension. Mm -hmm. Let's then do the example of, uh, uh, let's see that the example of, of SL2, or if you want, SLQ2 is, uh, we can do it uh, both at uh, the same time, uh, fits. Uh, this, uh, this definition. So here now, uh, SLQ2 is generated by these uh, uh, elements, modulo Q commutation relations. The quantum parabolic subgroup is generated by these elements, again, modulo Q commutation relations. And this is a, a, a Hopf algebra quotient from A to H that on the generators reads like that. Then the, uh, we have to construct the, uh, this sheaf and this sheaf here. Let's proceed. Mm -hmm. okay. First of all, the sheaf of uh, H comodule algebras. Well, the topology on CP1 that uh, will be uh, useful for this construction is a, a very uh, rough, uh, simple topology, is uh, uh, just uh, the, uh, let's say U1 is the uh, North Pole open and U2 is the South Pole open, okay? So- uh, And I guess U1, 2 is an in the intersection of U1. Yes. And this is the intersection, okay? So this is, uh, this uh, is uh, C, this is C, 
and this is a, a data set. C star, <laughs> C minus the point. Yes, exactly. So and the top to top is generated by the standard defined tovery. Exactly, yes, exactly. This is exactly the standard defined covering of your projective space. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, that's it. Yeah. So, um, and here are uh, the uh, algebra as uh, H comodule algebra. So you see what we are doing uh, is uh, we are considering a uh, localization of the algebra A. So to the total space, so to the to, to the open that is all CP1, we associate the total, uh, a, the comodule algebra A itself. Then we have to decide what to associate to the open U1. And this is simply the open, the algebra obtained doing a localization of A via the elements that does not, uh, that it is invertible in U1. Sorry, so alpha is not central in A, I suppose. That's the very point. If so it is, is a very big algebra. algebra. It's a very big algebra. It's a non-commutative algebra. Yes, yes, so... but, it, but I, I'm talking about the size of this algebra. If you are inverting this element alpha, which is not central, you are creating a quite big algebra, but much, I have to... much bigger than... Yes, so this algebra is bigger than this. Mm. this yeah. Definitely this is bigger than this. That's but... how going in, when you do localization. I, I still, uh, well, here it's not written, but um, corresponding to... Um, Let's say it was written here. Corresponding to this inclusion, usually you have morphisms that are restrictions. In the smooth context, uh, you have uh, restrictions here. Yes, that's clear. That's clear. Yeah. While here, you, you won't have a restriction. You will have uh, an inclusion, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, this nevertheless is a well-defined algebra because in the quantum case you check that alpha is an or satisfies the or condition so you can do a lo non-commutative localization mm -hmm. ah so we are using the or condition yeah yes this is a crucial point okay okay now similarly for the for the other open the uh, there is constructed inverting gamma that uh, again satisfies the order condition. And uh, on the double intersection, I have the double localization. So this is the this is the shift mm -hmm. that uh, uh, describes the total space. Um, one comment, uh, this is a shift of H comodule algebras because uh, the coaction, On A, on, on alpha, is simply alpha tensor, and you read it from here, tensor T. So you see this uh, coaction goes in an element that becomes invertible in uh, once I localize. And therefore, I can extend this coaction to a, co to a coaction on the localized algebra. Paolo, can I ask you as a mathematical physicist, uh, I would say, why, why, I mean, alpha, okay. Why you don't invert delta? I, I, I would say I would try to invert delta, but if you invert gamma, why not beta then? I mean, there is some, there are some reasons for that, perhaps, or this is just a choice. Yes. Gamma yes, satisfies yes. also this condition. You see it from here. The coaction goes with t minus one. Okay. These are the two elements that uh, where I can 
Okay, another thing is the localization with alpha and gamma exchanger. I mean, commuting, you can first localize with gamma and then alpha yes. inverse. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. And this is again another uh, requirement uh, okay. that here it's requirement or, or, or a fact coming from this oral structure or a condition. Very good point. So this is a fact. The two okay. commute. Later on, when discussing more general cases, we will need as a requirement or a condition on uh, multiple localizations. I have a question. Is this or condition enough to extend this shift to the risky topology of CP1? Or, it, or is this uh, very strictly related to this very poor topology generated by this very special covering? Mm. I must if, say you, I if you could, consider... if you could extend this to uh, to the Zariski topology, uh, this would uh, justify the name of of this uh, uh, Hopf Galois extension of principal bundle over CP one. But with this poor topology, if you cannot extend to Zariski topology, to regard this topology as an analog of CP one is. Uh, yeah, a little no, bit. No, I, I, I'm not regarding this topology as an analog of CP1. I'm using this topology to define a, a half galois extension. And now, formally, is everything OK? Yes, yeah. it is OK. But, but, but the message is Yeah, yeah exactly. I, 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 I completely concur with, with Tomek, because I was asking myself the same question. In, in, in order to see that you have some extension of classical formalism, you should take a natural sheet. You, you simply have uh, your, your your space with its natural topology, and uh, you should simply to every open subset in your topological space, you should uh, assign some nice polynomial algebra, and and that's what you really have given in in the classical uh, situation. So uh, the demand that somehow uh, this very poor sheaf uh, extends to 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 this canonically even the sheaf. Uh, by taking all open subsets in your topological space, I mean, after all, CP1 is, is not just something given by four sets. No, it no. Can I say something? Of course. Yes, please. Okay, so uh, I disagree with your point of view. I'll tell you why. Uh, first, uh, we're taking we're taking a particular topology which consists just of few open sets. Yes. So we have a perfectly well-defined topological space together with the sheaf on it. So we are very much authorized about talking about sheaf. Second objection I have on your more philosophical point of view is that if you know the schematic point of view on algebraic geometry tells you that uh, you recover the scheme if you know an open cover and the transition between two open. And that's exactly what we have. Perhaps uh, not in writing this paper, but in our sequence paper, we do have it. So we're telling you the ring of an of a, of like a, a dense open set. We cover the uh, you know the whole uh, space with these open sets, and then we tell you how to go from one to the other. So if you think about it, that's really the philosophy you take in geometry. Because let me ask you, when is it last time that you in your research computed every single open set of a manifold? You never do, right? You do an open cover and you work with that. That's really what we all do. So, I, I mean, this is my answer to your very well-founded objection, but that's how I feel about it. But this, this, this is not, not true because this reconstruction theorem assumes that you have this full topology and then you can take some covering. Okay, may I? Sorry, to Thomas. Identify Thomas, this. sorry, may I? Thomas, yeah, sure. before you continue, very simple. The quotient is non commutative, right? It's a non commutative version. It's a complex version of Bodley sphere. It's non commutative. No. It's not 
it, uh, it's not a real sphere. It's not a real sphere. It's not complex sphere. It's, it's not, not competitive about, sphere. No, no, no. It was a claim. It was not. A, it is the story is not about the public sphere. Yeah, exactly. The question is. I know that's better, guys. It's complex version, but it's non-commutative. No, it's not a complex S version. S SL two Q modulo P is not commutative. Fine, but but, but the question. That's but it. In other words, you are not trying to uh, do Zariski topology or anything like that. Yes. This only makes sense when you have a commutative algebra. But yeah. the question is about okay. the commutative algebra. Sorry? But, but the question we have is about the commutative object. We, we are completely happy. It is uh, not a commutative object, right? I know, I know. But we are asking about the commutative object. We take, we call one and we ask what happens. I mean, we don't have any objection. It's not an objection. We, 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 logical. we understand what is happening and everything is fully yeah. legal, so to speak. Yeah, it's so, so it's, it's, you cannot take full Zariski topology because then, then you queue everything. Right? Yeah. It, it, That's it. it. So, so, so it's it's more like like the sanity check. What happens when Q is equal to one? When you are fully commutative and it has just these four open subsets, this canonical F and covering. It doesn't really. When Q is equal to one, you recover standard construction period. That's what I wanted to hear. So, okay, you did ask it. Did I you? cannot. I cannot oh, wait. So. You are in Bologna, so that we can continue ah, this talk. So I yeah. just cannot <laughs> wait. Let's. Uh... <laughs> I'm looking forward. So, of course, we have covered the commutative case, the Q equal one case. So, and here, as I was already uh, anticipated, uh, the hmm. you know that you have uh, minus two minutes left. Uh, Piotrek, okay. you wrote until 7 p.m. and 7 o'clock. Yes, email. that's what I got, 7. Well, you wrote until minutes. 7 o'clock. We have 90 minutes. Uh, the 7 o'clock is with questions. So. Well, we have questions. Yeah, so just the uh, questions. Yeah. No, no, no. It's I mean, the the thing is that, on the way. just try to wind it up, that's all. I mean... Uh... Okay, so let me uh, finish this part. Uh, saying uh, that uh, similarly the algebra on the space not the h the, the other uh, shift is given here and uh, as you see are the coinvariants are, are uh, is is the polynomial algebra in one variable and and these are exactly the coinvariants that you can work out uh, not in a but uh, in once you, you localize with respect to alpha or localize to respect to alpha minus one. And, uh, and uh, going from this, uh, and on the double intersection, the restriction morphism is simply the inversion as, as usual. Okay, so this is an example that fully fits uh, this uh, definition. So uh, there are, uh, um, the definition works uh, nicely because you can give more general examples. And here is the construction. You take G, a complex semi-simple algebraic group, P, a parabolic subgroup. Then uh, you have a principal bundle on a projective variety. Then let's do take the quantizations of all such algebras. <clears throat> And then what you do classically, uh, you have, uh, you construct, uh, I mean, out of uh, G and P, you have the standard mechanism of induced uh, representations. And uh, here, uh, if you take uh, a, a representation that is a one dimensional representation, this means the same as considering a character of the parabolic group G, a P, and uh, this character can be automatically taught as an element of the algebra functions on P, and this element can be lifted to an element of the algebra of functions 
on sorry on the ele element of the algebra functions on G. Mm -hmm. This is a quotient of this, and uh, uh, this is uh, so. Here I'm recalling the construction of induced representation in the case for a character. Therefore, uh, a character can be taught uh, as uh, a non-vanishing section of uh, the line bundle here is the character over M and uh, that's why uh, this construction can be uh, generalized or uh, dualized to the non-commutative setting was done in this paper and uh, the corresponding construction is based on so-called quantum section that is an element of uh, the total uh, space algebra that in this case is a quantum group. Well, associated to this quantum section, uh, we have uh, um, so the, the classical construction is that uh, you consider sections of the line bundles. And the sections of the line bundles give you a, a projective embedding of uh, this uh, projective variety in, in some uh, projective space. So uh, here, uh, the construction is the same. If classically we consider the uh, line bundle obtained via this uh, character to be very ample, then this, uh, uh, the coproduct of this uh, quantum section, uh, mm, the elements out of the coproduct of the quantum sections are the analog of the sections of the, of the line bundle. And they generate the algebra of homogeneous coordinate ring of uh, the uh, projective variety. So the construction, uh, therefore, um, of, of, of this uh, algebra of, co uh, of homogeneous coordinate ring can be um, uh, enhanced to construct not, not only this, this algebra of homogeneous coordinate ring, but the, the full um, of Galois, uh, sorry, quantum principal bundle. So the also the algebras, the H comodule algebras. So here we have a theorem provided the all the conditions uh, are satisfied. This is uh, important, but we have verified that all the conditions are indeed satisfied for a uh, main example that is a complex projective space. So we take G to be or OQG to be SLQN. <clears throat> These uh, successive uh, localizations give a shift of algebras over uh, the um, projective uh, uh, variety. These uh, um, uh, where here the UI, as in the case of SL2, are defined as the opens such that, okay, so let's uh, just write this. In the classical case, uh, there are opens VI where the these uh, elements SI are invertible, and these opens UI project to opens UI. These are the opens that we consider. So the opens are labeled simply by these elements in the Hopf algebra, in the total Hopf algebra, OQG. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the construction is that uh, this uh, um, localizing, as we did the, in the SL2 case, this of algebra with respect uh, to these elements and considering these uh, 
al elements that these algebras reach uh, multiple open here, capital I is a multiple lab uh, where all these uh, sections can be, functions can be inverted. Well, this gives the two um, sheaves of algebras and of H commodial algebras. And these two sheaves are such that <clears throat> Uh, define indeed a quantum principal bundle according to the original definition. Okay, so very briefly, uh, now I would like uh, to do a next step and go to the um, differential calculi on, on such shifts. But I'm so, afraid this you should skip because it's there's no time for this. Okay, well, then uh, I just say it in one word. Uh, the OR extension uh, can be done also at the level of differential calculi. It's uh, actually canonical. And the result is that there is a comp compatible with such a definition of quantum principal bundle, there is a definition of differential calculi on such qui principal bundle. Mm -hmm. The key notion is that the differential is asked to have the derivation property and the subjectivity property, property just on stocks. With this definition, <clears throat> we can construct um, differential calculus, calculi on such quantum principal bundles. And as examples, we give uh, the examples of uh, the total space algebra being GRQ2 mm -hmm. over CP1. Here, uh, this is uh, actually a quantum principal bundle where the analog of the exact uh, sequence condition that now is on the Stokes holds. And we prove it explicitly that, that it holds. And another example that uh, uh, is not uh, a quantum, uh, is a quantum principle, is a, a differential calculus, but is not covariant, is principal calculus, but is not covariant, is when instead of SL2, we consider, uh, instead of GL2, we consider SL2. Because when we consider SL2 and the parabolics are grouped in SL2, then, uh, as I said before, uh, there are, uh, the, well, I didn't say it before, but the sequence, uh, this, uh, this sequence for on the local patches, this index I corresponds to a local patch, is, uh, is exact, but, uh, I, I'm losing the covariance because uh, I'm taking on SL2 the left H covariant differential calculus, so I don't have any more any right H covariance. Okay, so uh, with this, uh, I conclude there. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for your interest and the questions. Okay, any questions? Maybe we start with the Zoom Fox. Richard, Rita, any questions, comments, complaints, suggestions? No, Rita, okay. Richard, you want to ask a question? Uh, yes, so it's kind of question. Mm -hmm. So take SUQ2, so mm -hmm. not SL2C, but SUQ2 and action of a circle on that. Yes. The quotient is, of course, the polar sphere. Mm -hmm. So yeah. as far as I can see, so what's happening here is that you think of the algebra function, uh, polar sphere as gluing two copies of uh, Teplitz algebras. So basically two by two matrices uh, with, with Teplitz algebras on the diagonal and compacts of the diagonal. And you have this coaction of, of, co of a circle. Yes, yes. Right? So yeah. they're, they're, that's your picture somehow, right? Yes, indeed, this okay. picture of uh, principal bundle applies also yeah. to um, 
uh, a fine variety <laughs> like the, the one we are discussing. The, okay. the, which is the difference? That in this case, if we know the... Um, um, if we know the the, uh, the algebras locally, we can glue them together, and mm -hmm. we can recover. Uh, so, in this case, uh, the shift uh, as an extra property is a flabby shift, and yeah. so we can recover the total space, and the total space has the property of being a half Galois extension also. Yeah, I, I guess so. To avoid this kind of questions like Thomas, I just say that when you are gluing these things, you are not gluing uh, commutative spaces. Yes. You are doing some kind of, uh, I, yeah. I don't know, you call it push out or something, so push out systems of algebras, right? Something like this. So it is a gluing, but in some category of non commutative algebras. It's not. That's why. You, it's, so it's I, or a localized. Either push out or pull back. I don't know. I have no idea what you call it, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. So what, what do you call the, uh, this gluing two copies of tablets algebra with compact? What do you call it? But, um, what do you mean gluing? I, 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 I would call it the the the, the, the canonical, uh, how do you call it? The... Um, mm, it's, it's a piecewise of Galois extension. Yeah. Over the... No, no, no. The Galois extension is Galois... Sorry, Galois extension. We are talking about the spotlight sphere. There's no extension at the moment. No Galois thing at the moment. The spotlight sphere itself. Oh. Right? So you think of this space as kind of construction. It's really... Yeah, it is push out, actually. It's a push out. You have two copies of the algebras. You have the same copy of compacts in both of them, and push out of this thing is uh, so is the algebra corresponding to Podley sphere. But are you really talking about the standard Podley sphere, not the equatorial one? It's equatorial one, yeah. So, so that's a completely different. The st standard one is slightly no, no. Standard one is slightly more complicated, right? Yeah. So this yeah, but, is, yes. So but, with this, but, with this but, cutting. Yeah, yes. But his example is about standard. It's a, it's a classical covering. Yeah. Yep. So it's basically the same, right? Compacts and you add one. You have coaction of, uh, well, Z, right? Do you do all of a circle? Sure, sure. But, but and, I, I, you, and that's your gluing, right? Yes. So, yes. so. And it's fine. It's just, it's, uh, as uh, basically the point is that, uh, you uh, your cal you do the localizations uh, whenever you can, right? Whenever yes, you have your condition, you, you do you, yes, you do localization whenever you can, and in the case of uh, complex projective space, you can do localization. In the case of Grassmannian, uh, we have a, let's say uh, we think it's possible, but uh, the checking of the other condition is uh, highly non-trivial and requires uh, mm -hmm. a lot of thinking. That's uh, that's the status. Okay. But, well, but, thank you for the lecture, by the way. <laughs> thank you. But I have my my doubts. Uh, is it when you look about SQ two versus SLQ two? I mean, the difference the start from. Right. Well, I mean, so he, he didn't hear the well. difference between SUQ2 and SLQ2 is just the star structure, right? You're just equipping your your Hopf algebra with a star structure, right? That's what happens. This is how you differ between SLQ2 and SUQ2. You well, it it depends. depends. You think in, in terms of smooth functions, yes, but here we are taking a Regular functions, ah, regular functions. No. functions. No. Rational functions. Holomorphic rational functions. Exactly. But, but, but nevertheless, is the star structure, which is uh, inherent in SUQ2, is it compatible with your localizations? Probably, yes. Probably, yes. Mm -hmm. Because if you intersect everything with uh, this uh, unitary trick of Weil, mm -hmm. so introducing the star structure is like pa passing to uh, to uh, 
the, the set of, of real points of the complexification okay. of this okay. quad uh, Rita was talking about. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So after this unitary trick, mm -hmm. uh, instead of topology in terms of open subset, you obtain a compact covering. Mm -hmm. uh, so combinatorially, it is the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, but but in fact, uh, these things are comparable because of the fact that you are talking, I'm talking about uh, Paolo and, and Rita, you are talking about uh, to Alex finite Alexandrov topology of yes. the combinatorial type of a yes. covering. Yes. If, if you think about uh, flag varieties or mm -hmm. some, some other things, uh, probably this topology would come from uh, the um, root system mm -hmm. of the group and uh, its uh, parabolic subgroup. Mm -hmm. But it's pure combinatorial thing, yes. which can be realized on, on the level of algebraic geometry in terms of, of, of these regular uh, rational functions on, on these mm -hmm. open subsets and gluing something to, 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 to some scheme, projective scheme. Or it could be glued from, from real functions, uh, continuous or, or or even smooth on, 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 on compact pieces, which you are gluing. So, so, so these things are, are compatible. But, but the point is that everything works because of the reduction to a very standard covering. And this standard covering is a, is a combinatorial object. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, OK, so, so it is, I, I can <laughs> make my complaint again that is speaking about uh, projective varieties uh, assumes that, that, for instance, the, the definition of a shift with respect to topology is that you can take any covering from this topology. If your topology consists... Hey, the, the, Thomas, Thomas, yeah. topolo, uh, to, uh, the notion of topology is somewhat more general than, than what you are thinking of, okay? Topology so, is keeping a base of, base of Covering cover, coverings, right? You give some coverings, they define topology. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You, you are really thinking of uh, the classical commutative situation. Yes, right? but the space On top is of it, you think of subspace, of right? Your topology is more easy. So in this case, the topology is given by uh, over coverings, which come so by inverting over elements which satisfy all a condition. So that's the, it is a very big that's topology. How the topology. Yeah. And indeed, it would be nice to simply yeah, so, so, so for, think of it uh, in terms of... So my uh, question was, can the only condition be used to extend the shift condition to topology more general than this Alexandrov one? I feel, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. That's the question. So this was precisely my question. And this is exactly the question I had in mind. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Yeah. Most probably, but that's exercise for you. <laughs> Do the exercise. Find out what kind of uh, group elements, uh, gr functions on the group satisfy all these exercises, Richard. Yeah. It's serious. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, a, it's kind of, there's kind of obvious answer to it, right? Your topology is given by there is topology where you invert, you invert elements, so functions of the group which satisfy all a condition. That, that's the topology. And certainly it's larger than these two sets, right? So this, this was my question. Yeah, that's then the topology, what it is. The topology wider yeah. than, than uh, is this, this, this uh, Alexandrov one. And, and you said that this is an exercise to check that or a topology. No, exercise to check how big is this topology. That's a statement. I'm making a statement. This works when you look at the topology generated by open sets, which you get by inverting over elements, over functions which satisfy or a condition. Oh, sure, sure. It's a statement. Yeah, but, but the question is, is and this it, class... Yeah of open, yeah. whatever it is, this subset, uh, for which you can uh, you apply this yeah. for a condition. The question is whether this is a topology. We are, of course, topology. 
That is the it's an, it is. Because it's topology. Yes, in that's which topology. Sense? In, in, the, uh, in the, grot, the grot, sense grot of Grothendieck, of course, right? Yeah. Uh, no, no, it's not usual. Okay. If Grothendieck, it means not usual. It's sense of uh, Grothendieck, right? But there is a pro but it's a problem. Is it the Grothendieck topology with respect to some seeds? Or with no, Grothendieck to topology is a Grothendieck topology, right? It's a topology, so, in this case, topology on the excellent CP1, right? Or CPN for that matter. It's not the standard topology. But classical, it cannot be. Oh, classical uh, Grothendieck topology, classical in, this, in all this uh, the context of projective varieties, is defined by, by means of uh, fiber products. Hey. But, but our condition is not is does not have a universal. No, property. no, no. Yes. Grothendieck topology has nothing to do with fiber products. Grothendieck topology okay. is given by coverings. By C. No, you no, define no, no. what C's. is a no. no, no, no you define what, no. That's crap. You define what is a covering, and you pick up certain class of coverings. They give you the topology. So, so, and so sheaves are, are sheaves of topology, about, right? No, no. Definition of covering of coverage. No, it's not coverage. no, it's a, it's this GA. It's Grothendieck. No, it's not Grothendieck because Grothendieck must satisfy this uh, uh, satur saturation property with respect to seeds. No, uh, in Johnson's approach, uh, you have on, only these uh, these uh, coverings. But the question is. Uh, are uh, uh, Thomas, Thomas, sorry, Thomas, we are in 2024. Everybody talks about uh, uh, infinite categories and the stuff, right? Yeah, so it's, it's my That's question. what we are talking about, right? How far you have to uh, generalize the, 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 the notion of topology to regard these things to be generalized topology? You don't. No, no, but it's a, they are. No, you don't need to generalize anything. So, okay, guys, let me stop this discussion. Yeah, so it's yeah maybe we should stop it, yes. Uh, to this joint and for future yes. references. Uh, please, no swear words during the recording. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, you're right. And it goes on YouTube forever, so, you know. Yeah. Uh, we can swear after I stop recording. Okay. Uh, but yeah, let okay. me come back more to the talk, if I may, because... Uh, uh, I, I have some, you know, um, concerns, uh, which uh, Paolo and Rita might answer. You see, when you look at uh, this quantum Hof vibrations from the point of view of sister algebras, the situation is very asymmetric. You have a pullback of sister algebras, but what you have, you take the template sister algebra, have a simple map onto the circle, but 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 then then you have uh, you basically shrink this boundary circle to a point and you get in this minimal initialization of compact operators. So this pullback is asymmetric. You know, you have a symmetric pullback when you talk that talk, talk generic podless quantum C have this equatorial podless quantum C have and really you have something like P size triviality, local triviality, uh, uh, stuff like this. Uh, but but not really in this uh, non-commutative case. Uh, sorry, not in, not really in this uh, standard Polish uh, quantum sphere case. Uh, so, so I'm wondering now that you 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 pass to this completely algebraic description, not sister algebraic algebraic. Uh, so you do it via localization, not by the pullback of of, of sister algebras. Uh, then, then I'm wondering, do you still see this asymmetry? Uh, because when, when I look at your, the definition of your sheet, right, uh, uh, you have U1, U2, and then uh, you have a functor designed with commodial algebras and so on and so forth. So, so do you also have this kind of asymmetry at your level? When I look, uh, when I look at, at, because you, you, you wrote some elements, fine, uh, F, F, U1, 2, F, 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 uh, is, is it the, ah okay actually it's it's visible so F U two is different from F uh, no wait wait a second F U one and F U two when I look at them as 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 commodal algebras are they uh, isomorphic or not how, how do they differ F of U one and F of U two I'd be very happy to see what are these commodal algebras so uh, but this is a uh, you uh, said F of U one this this uh, as a 
you said f of u1 and f of u2 mm -hmm. so this one let's say uh, let's write it down this one but because you see gamma is normal and alpha one is not so maybe ah, but I said you too, sorry forget about it i'm sorry i'm sorry yeah. so th these are uh, well, the, automorphism the, relating these two Yes, so okay. I'll tell you, this is uh, this is actually. Uh, so let me write it uh, in a corner. Uh, so in the specific case, uh, this uh, uh, is not only uh, half Galois is even cleft. Uh, cleft multiplicative. So oh, um, <laughs> we have that f of u one. is uh, uh, isomorphic to, uh, how do you call it, let's, B1. Yeah, this is your, your is what I call C1 here. of U1. Yeah. This is this is what I call B1, okay? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yes. I this, yes. This answers my second question. So I don't have to ask it. <laughs> this is fully symmetric. Yeah, that's fine. But, but yes. now B1 and B2 relate. No, B1 and B2 are just uh, polynomials in V, polynomials in U, and they go from one to the other, inverting ah, on the course. double intersection. So how are these related on the double intersection? So there is a canonical uh, morphism from F, um, uh, let me think a second. Um, U one two injects into U one, so F U one goes into F U one restricted to U one two, and then I have also F U two that goes to F U two restricted to u12 so now i'm asking th this is the analog of saying which is the transition function between these two local trivializations mm -hmm. and the transition function is built exactly out of the cleaving uh, the multiplicative cleaving maps that are nothing else than the sections of the the local sections and indeed the transition function i let me call it phi 1 2 is uh, J1 convolution product J2 minus one, because these are... Uh... Yeah, yeah, it's clear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here, the point is that, uh, as expected, uh, it, go oops, it goes down to, in principle, is in the algebra, but uh, it is uh, in the subalgebra of covariance. Yes. Now you see, uh, my, 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 my problem is that in this Q deformation, when you look at uh, this unit interval over which the whole S3 hangs, so classically, you know, it's just a family of solid tori shrinking to, sorry, family of, of two tori shrinking to uh, circles at the endpoints. Uh, but, but now when you look, uh, uh, and this is gamma, gamma star, if you want, so in, in your language would be gamma, gamma, gamma beta, okay? Uh, that is uh, interval. And, uh, and, and, and uh, classically it's just the interval. But when you go to this Q deformation, uh, you just get the powers of Q. And, 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 and here we have is a symmetry because Q to the power of zero is one. So one endpoint of your interval exists. In, it is in your algebra, but the other endpoint is not. I mean, you have you take Q to arbitrary powers, and of course you approach zero. It's a, it's a, an accumulation point, but but in fact zero is not a power of Q, and 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 this is reflected in this fact that you have only one character in in the standard pole here, the north pole. You do not have the south pole. 
Yeah, but and I'm wondering where you see this asymmetry in your picture. That's what bothers you. Cannot see this asymmetry because this asymmetry lives in the star structure. Okay, Q lives okay, in the star structure. Okay, that's a... now look. Okay. If you see C of U, for instance, uh -huh, uh -huh. you are looking at the poly polynomial algebra, which is commutative. Yes, no Q. Yes, so non commutative structure of the disk uh -huh. comes from the fact that you have this. U star yes. and commutation relation between U and U star. Correct. If you don't have this U star, everything becomes classical. Yeah. And you are doing something classical. So the quotient, look, this quotient uh, shift of uh, shift of invariance mm -hmm. of this coaxial mm -hmm. is completely commutative. Mm -hmm. C of U, C of V, C of U, U inverse. It's com. It is. Nothing non commutative nothing. It's a very special you. case due to uh, that uh, we are in uh, CP1. You see, here we are considering CP1 as the complex line. Yeah. And indeed, as soon as you want to complexify it, uh, then you introduce also anti holomorphic coordinates. Yes. Then the you have to introduce the commutation Q. relation between Z and Z bar. Mm -hmm. And it's so really commute. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tomek. This is exactly what I wanted to hear. But but this what this what I'm talking about is in the star structure. It is absent here. And only right now I kind of realized that you don't have CP1Q here. You can <laughs> yeah. you can really <laughs> exactly you have, you have something uh, completely commutative. Okay. Okay. So now now I understand. But but that's why I was so suspicious about uh, uh, Richard's claim that now if you go really to SU2 and the sphere, not your CP1 and SL2. And parabolic group, then things are the same. I I I I, I, I doubt he was right. No, no. Well, I don't know because this this is a very special case of CP one. Uh, as soon as you go to CP two, you already you are fully in the non commutative algebra yeah. already without uh, maybe not so fully not fully because if you have holomorphic variables mm -hmm. which do not commute, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which happens in higher dimensions. Yeah. Then you have even in, in in on the level of this holomorphic part, you have non-commutativity. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you cannot see this uh, non-commutativity of the non-commutative disk here. Yes, I agree. Because it's only so U is Z. Yeah. You don't have Z bar, Z star. Yeah. Exactly. There's no Z bar and uh, W. <laughs> And uh, Tomek is already uh, gone, but I, I remember that in this uh, uh, original uh, Brzezinski magic paper from 30 years ago. 93, they, yes, yes. Where they kind of introduced this uh, standard Absolutely. quantum hole yes. vibration, there was some discussion of localization. There was. But 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 I I know a story that Alessandra Frabetti found uh, that what they wrote about the localization was wrong, and I remember that she she was telling me about you know taking a train and traveling to a conference to speak to Shan Majid to point him an error in his paper, and 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 uh, uh, I remember there was some snuff with localization, but it was already goes back to thirty years ago when they attempted to, to look at this kind of localization in the context of uh, the, the quantum hop vibration. So it would be nice to revisit the, the paper to see. I also don't remember, it's been many years ago, yeah. Uh, to see what uh, what they write about this localization. Yeah. But but it's uh, I'm, I'm very happy that you answered my second question before I asked it, that is, in this particular case, when you look at um, this sheaf of commodial algebras, uh, all these uh, sheaves that you get here, I mean, these important ones, F1, FU2, uh, are, are really smash problems. That's uh, exactly what, yeah. I, what I expected. That's, uh, this is that how it should yes. be. That's how it should be. That's, that's, it's, you, you, you get more than here than just a quantum principle bundle. You get a locally trivial quantum principle bundle. No, in the paper, uh, the, uh, the, the... 2021 paper, we have also examples where uh, the uh, local trivializations are really left, not smashed. Sure, sure. No, 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 of course. I mean, you have a general concept, right? It doesn't have to be left, it doesn't have to be smashed. But it's it's very nice, and I believe you defined it in one of your papers. 
uh, that you call your quantum principle bundle locally trivial if, if this comodule algebra that you assign, but if there exists at least some covering, uh, yes. it's some restriction, yes, there exists some covering which is part of your sheaf, uh, is such that uh, if the values of your sheaf are in smash four. Yes, a la Stanford, let's say, quantum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. There is, there is some version because I remember it from one of your papers, and and it makes perfect sense. And and this uh, example instantiates uh, such local triviality. Okay, okay. I think uh, that our dinner is getting cold. So uh, if there are no immediate and necessary questions from the room or the Zoom, uh, let's uh, thank Paolo again and uh, and, Rita. Helpers, and Rita and Thomas. Thank you guys so much. Thank, thank you to you. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. My pleasure. For the next